final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 13774 in the name of Alex Johnson on minimum room sizes in new build homes. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I'd be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could please press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Alex Johnson to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Johnson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. When is a room not a room? We in this chamber have had cause over recent years on many occasions to discuss the concepts of under-occupancy and overcrowding. But one of the ironic things that was thrown up by that discussion was the amazing uh, court case which went through a Scottish court and at a hearing, a Scottish sheriff dictated that a room could not be classified as a room because it was simply not big enough to be described as a bedroom. How did we get to that extraordinary position? Well, rabbit hutch and shoebox are just two of the terms I've heard used to describe the room sizes in modern homes, often by people who have just returned, dejected from a visit to a show home or a new development. I would stress at the outset that not all new homes are like this, of course. Many are delightfully designed, uh, spacious and with excellent amenities, although some of these, I would argue, are in the premium bracket. But the overall uh, issue is that there is a trend for modern homes to get smaller. This can be the case when land values is, are high, such as they are in the North East, and a developer needs to maximise the number of units on the land to make a project viable. We hear a lot about many houses uh, need to be built to keep the pace with demand, uh, and this was the point made loud and clear when I attended the Homes for Scotland conference last week. But I'm sure not, I'm not alone in being deeply concerned that in the race to play the numbers game, floor sizes of new properties will be sacrificed in order to maximise the number of units. We need only look across Europe at the average floor space of newly built homes to illustrate the problem. In Germany, the average house is over 109 square metres of floor space. In Holland, it's over 115 square metres. In Denmark, it's 137 square metres. We need a bit more research here in Scotland before we can have a definitive Scottish figure for that. But one study suggests that the average UK home is now smaller than that with a little over 76 square metres of floor space. To put this into perspective, just two square metres is the size of a broom cupboard or a small room with a toilet or a, a room with a washing machine and maybe a drying rack. Four square metres, according to the Royal Institute of British Architects, is equivalent to a single bed. That's not room for a single bed, that's about the size of a single bed. Crucially, for children and students, four square metres is the space that allows you to work at home at a computer. Seven square metres is the equivalent of a galley kitchen, maybe with a coffee table, while eight square metres is the equivalent of a single bedroom giving room for a guest to stay over, perhaps, or more importantly, a room for a child. The long-term effect on people living in homes that are effectively overcrowded at the outset are deeply worrying. For example, studies by researchers at the Cambridge University suggest that in extreme cases, overcrowded homes can cause physical illnesses such as asthma and even mental illnesses such as depression. The fact that individuals report that they do not have enough space to have quiet time in private may be a contributing factor. Less extreme cases can impact on the social and emotional, de emotional development of children, while at the same time degrading relationships and making it difficult to entertain guests. In 2009, a study by the Royal Institute of British Architects found that more than half of respondents said there was not enough space for the furniture they owned or would like to own. Nearly 70% said there was not enough storage for their possessions. In one case, a householder had to store his hoover at his mother's house because he didn't have a cupboard to keep it in. And the weekly shop, with a number of buy one, get one free offers, had also thrown limited kitchen space into chaos. The issue is one that does not, justify, uh, does not just affect larger households. 
It can impact people from all walks of life, from a sing the single person being offered a flat with a so-called mezzanine deck as a bedroom, to the retired person moving into a care home where they have little space to keep their most precious possessions built up over a lifetime. There's some legislation that has some influence on this. For example, homes in multiple occupation, uh, while others influence the situation almost by accident, such as the need to build accessibility uh, as described in the Scottish Government's technical handbook. I also welcome the discussion paper, which will not impact us here in Scotland, but was issued by the UK Government last week, that proposes a minimum bedroom size of 6.5 square metres, with local authorities free to set higher standards if they wish to do so. But as I pointed out earlier, 6.5 square metres is not a big room. I appreciate that there are counter-arguments for this, for example, that the extra space would drive up construction costs and thereby make homes even less affordable, and that the demand for larger homes would see fewer units built in available sites. But quoting again from the Royal Institute of British Architects, they suggest that this need not be the case. Their view is that a home that is 10% bigger need not cost 10% more. And they also state that extra space needed need not impact on housing numbers if better design were implemented. I would like to see the Scottish Government, with local authorities, housing professionals and developers, work together to ensure that new properties are not only spatially fit for purpose, but they also form part of a wider urban design that delivers safe, sustainable communities and encourages active lifestyles. And when I say active lifestyles, I don't, of course, mean the London man who was offered a house where he had to stand on top of his fridge and climb up a ladder in order to get into bed every night, as was recently reported. This is not to say that advances have not been made in the construction of new homes in Scotland. We have, for example, seen the introduction of improved insulation regulations, which keep our homes warmer and help alleviate the threat of fuel poverty. I welcome and support these measures. But if we want to do something about the problem of rabbit hutch housing, then a number of influences will need to pull together and press for change. Whether or not we own our homes or rent them, the quality of housing is vital to us all. And that doesn't mean only that they are wind and water tight and easy to heat. The room to live is also important. We can deliver this if we collectively take the necessary action. If the Scottish Government will push this issue, they can be certain of support from the Scottish Conservatives. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes or so. I call Hans Alan Malik. Ah, thank you very much and good evening, Presiding Officer. First of all, please allow me to thank Alec Johnston for securing today's debate on minimum room size in new built homes. Mr Malik, could you move your microphone slightly towards you? Many thanks. Thank you. Uh, in fact, I would go further and suggest that we also explore the possibility of having a minimum percentage of large family homes in any new development as well, as more and more people choose to look after their elderly families within the family house and or also allow their children to stay longer at the home, which is a good trend, if I may say so. I also acknowledge the um, importance, uh, sorry, I also uh, acknowledge the improvements in the construction industry and new built homes, especially in regards to insulation. Uh, they, these examples are good and use of space in houses as well as outside. However, there are also plenty of bad examples where people would not choose to live if they had sufficient housing in stock in Scotland. We must ensure that minimum standards uh, relating to room sizes, hallways, and storage uh, in our homes is secured. For practical reasons, as we spend quite a lot of time in our homes, if you furnish your home, one expects to be able to get in and around the house, which means a reasonable size of rooms, halls, and storage space in a given house not forgetting the outdoor environment that we live in. If we have 
a, a set size of what we can call a double bed, then we can set a minimum size for what we can call a double bedroom. We must make, take account of not only the insulation houses alone, but, not, but also we need to have a well-designed home which addresses the needs of today's families. For example, a number of sockets in any given room, not hidden behind doors or behind furniture, that there should be easy access. Sometimes pe people forget that we are no longer living in the years that we used to 20 years ago. Uh, the demand on our, our, our sockets is uh, far more than sometimes we give credit for. I have visited many homes to see all sorts of uh, extension wires uh, and, a, and a maze of uh, wires on the floor making a, um, a real hazard for particularly young and their elderly. I agree with Alec Johnson. There should be a voluntary code that would be, we see the maximum space, uh, floor space, storage sizes of homes and their standards in flats and homes must reflect today's and tomorrow's expectations and needs of our people in Scotland. And if the construction industry can't come up with a code of practice, perhaps the Scottish Parliament can help them in that direction. But I think one of the things that I, mu I must say that when Alec Johnson says that you know, the, house, the room sizes need to be appropriate, I think that is absolutely crucial uh, because this affects uh, all sorts of uh, issues, particularly amongst our young. Um, one of the things that I was told that um, inappropriate housing can actually affect the health of young, young children, and not only in terms of mental health or uh, physical health, but also their educational attainment standards as well, because people do need the room to be able to sit down and study. So I do hope that the government will take on this challenge and try to see if, how they can help us. But I also, uh, I just wanted to go emphasize the importance of larger family homes as well as appropriate to sizes of rooms, because as I say, the trend is changing. It's to be welcomed. We want to look after the elderly if we can, rather than ask them to go to hospitals or other centers. So I look forward to the Scottish Government's uh, view on this challenge. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. Uh, since I have no more requests in the open debate to speak, could I now invite uh, Marco Biaggi to respond to the debate. Minister, I can give you seven minutes or so. Thank you. Well, when I originally saw that this uh, member's de business debate was taking place, I was uh, a bit pleased, but also a little bit intrigued uh, by the motion. I was pleased that the motion does give the recognition that Alex Johnson then extended in his speech that through Scottish building standards, we have significantly improved the energy efficiency standards for new homes. This is something we can all welcome, we all have in this chamber, because it makes them warmer, it helps households with fuel bills, and in terms of delivering carbon dioxide abatement, not only is it helpful, but since this October, our standards are once again the best minimum standards within the UK. However, I was intrigued that the motion considered that Scotland has no minimum space standards or built-in storage for new homes. And today, through this debate and my response, I would like to just dispel this myth. And uh, as building standards forms part of my portfolio, I'd like to say a little bit about what those national standards in Scotland are. However, I would just want to draw a distinction between what can be governed by building standards and what can uh, be done, uh, dealt with more widely, because clearly buildings that were approved under building standard regimes in the past will continue to be with us for some time. In particular, that can have issues for uh, electricals, other areas where you know, the needs of society have changed, but the homes need to, to catch up to adapt. We apply building standards at the point of construction. Now, since the mid-1980s, through the Scottish building standard system and now within the domestic technical handbook, we actually have minimum space standards that are the best of any of the jurisdictions in the UK. The framework presented consists of defined sizes of appliances and furniture combined with clearly defined activity spaces. This means that the floor area of habitable rooms as well as main bathrooms and kitchens will have to be of a reasonable size. 
Allied to that, more recently, we've introduced a measure that means one habitable room is to have a floor area of at least 12 square metres. In addition to the measures that create minimum floor area, there are many other provisions that contribute to the physical and mental well-being of householders. These include guaranteed provisions for natural light, for limiting noise in attached homes and, and rooms within homes, ventilation, adequate heating, to name but a few of our standards. All of this means that any new home in Scotland, when allied to other supporting legislation, water bylaws, for example, should be able to adequately and satisfactorily perform the function of a dwelling. Unlike Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland have nothing that is quite as comprehensive in each of their sets of devolved building regulations. However, I acknowledge that these regulations are bedrock minimum standards. But also, as I said before, building regulations themselves cannot be the panacea for all ills. For example, they're not going to stop a small house being occupied by more people than it was ever designed for. Um, Over-occupancy and under-occupancy are both uh, issues of housing policy, or it, will it dictate how people use their homes once they move in, how they are maintained by owners, and so on and so forth. Yes. Hans Alamalik. Thank you very much for taking an intervention. Uh, there were just two points I wanted to reiterate, just for clarity. One is, in terms of the Scottish communities now are changing, uh, fundamentally changing, that more and more adults are staying with their families and children are staying longer with their families. So that's one aspect that I want you to take on board for me, please, and when I talk about percentages of larger homes. The second point that I was raising was, which is a, an issue about safety, a child's room can have as many as 10 demands of electricity sockets. Now, that's just average. Uh, so, uh, and we're not addressing that, and I think it would be helpful if we could address those, please. Okay. Minister? Well, I can give an undertaking on the latter issue to go to my officials and uh, go over that, uh, that aspect of the, the building standards for new build, because clearly we do want properties that are being built now to meet the, the demands of, of people and leave aside the issue of retrofitting the, the more heritage-based properties. The issue that Hans Allah Malik had raised on this, the mix of homes I was about to come to, uh, I, I do think it is important in dealing with some of the big societal issues we have, in particular the ageing population, changing, changing habitation, which actually also means more people living alone than ever before, we need to take a cross-government approach on that. And just as building standards has been involved in the government's discussions on uh, climate change action, we have to be involved in our discussions on how we deal with the, the ageing society. So I take very much accept that point and I take it on board. To, to go back to the, the flow of where I was, I, I, there's... There are these minimum standards. Uh, the, there's also now the suggestion uh, of a voluntary code for space standards that would give benchmark for industry to deliver good practice. I, I want to caution on it, the development of any approach, though, that would produce purely arbitrary floor areas without that understanding that I'd referred to of how it's going to be used, how people are going to interact, and which could make houses larger and less affordable in the short term, and while over the longer term the market be, may be able to adjust, this could present serious difficulties for housing supply, as well as pressures on the types of homes that may be being built, and we need to be aware of that. I think it is an unusual uh, presentation uh, in this chamber for Alex Johnson to come here and recommend that the Scottish Government intervene so firmly in industry and the market. If this is his conversion to, uh, to state socialism, then I, I am I'm, I'm surprised and blown away. But I suspect that uh, he might generally, usually prefer more voluntary codes. And there is a document like that out there at the moment. It's called Housing for Varying Needs. It's available online and it's a good practice document that social housing providers and local authorities in Scotland have to build to if they wish to access grant funding from the Scottish Government. It functions in a similar way to the space standards in the Domestic Technical Handbook. So it also sets out a framework that determines the size of a home. But because it is a 
good practice document and not firm building regulations. It consists of defined sizes of an even greater range of appliances and furniture, combined with defined activity spaces and circulation paths, creating a much broader set of guidance and good practice about the structure of a home. It certainly is the case that this could be uh, discussed, uh, disseminated more widely, and uh, Margaret Burgess and I would be very interested in hearing any views from the industry or otherwise about how this document could be adopted more widely. So to conclude, I welcome this debate. It gives us a chance to explore the possibilities of space standards, to bust some myths, but also to recognise what building standards can uh, deliver. I certainly agree with the concept of a voluntary code. It would result in good floor space and storage standards in flats and houses in North East Scotland and across the country. But above all, we've got to make sure that we have a positive impact in everything we do on housing supply so that we have the right number of homes being built in Scotland and indeed the right composition of those homes too. So uh, I, I thank uh, Alex Johnson for bringing this debate, even if I haven't been able to entirely agree with him. Many thanks, Minister. And that concludes Alex Johnson's debate on minimum room sizes in new-built homes. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.